Good morning, Gray CC. So I would like to thank you very much for having me here this Sunday. Um, I'm thrilled to meet Pastor Ted's church family. And uh, since I am your brother in Christ, we are family members as well. You know what they say, you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family. Ted was my assessor during pastoral assessment. And uh, the thing I don't get, my pastors at Community EC do the same thing. They wear long pants with flip flops. I just don't get that. It's like wearing white after Labor Day. And I always bust their chops about it. And so I was in Israel with one of the pastors and uh, they served dinner only till six o'clock. So I quick took a shower, put on jeans, a t-shirt. And the one time, I swear it was one time, I wore long pants with flip flops. They took a picture of it and circulated it through the whole church. And that thing pops up like a cold sore when I least want it. So uh, anyhow, Ted's a really good guy. And as, as you know, my name's Larry. My full name is Lawrence Stephen Bentz. My, uh, when my mom was angry at me, she would insert my confirmation name as well. I'm an ex-Catholic, and she would call me Lawrence Stephen Michael Bentz. And then she would follow that up with, uh, wait till your father gets home. But my road name in uh, the ministry is Gunner. And Triple Tree Ministries is a motorcycle ministry. And although we reach out to the motorcycle community at large, our primary focus is the 1% motorcycle clubs. And for those of you who don't know what a 1% motorcycle club is, uh, back in 1947 in Hollister, California, there were motorcycle races and a bunch of clubs all came to attend the races. Well, things got a little out of hand and they had to call the police to restore order. Well, um, because of that event, the newspaper sensationalized it, they embellished it, and America became enthralled with this, this new subversive subculture in the motorcycle community, so much so that Life Magazine did an expose on it. And Life Magazine uh, sought a quote from the American Motorcyclist Association, the AMA, in which the American Motorcyclist Association denounced the bikers, stating, and I quote, 99% of its members were law-abiding citizens, Thereby, thereby marginalizing the 1% as outlaws. And the outlaw motorcycle clubs or the 1% motorcycle clubs in the area, you know who they are, we don't name drop. So as you see on, the, uh, on our website, it says some wish to live within the sound of a church or chapel bell. We want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. But I'll get back to Triple Tree ministries in a little bit. I'd like to know a little bit about you first. How many of you have a picture of your pet on your cell phone? Wow. Um, how many of you are cat lovers? When I'm, why? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know, if, uh, if cats could text, they wouldn't. So when I was, when I was dating my wife, uh, I only found out how much of a cat person she was after I told her I loved her, and it was too late. And uh, I mean, I was smitten, you know, I was head over heels in love with her, and I, I just rationalized it as it could be worse. She could be a Cowboys fan. And so uh, now that we know the cat people, how many are dog people? Oh good, I'm a dog person. I love dogs. I, what I love about dog people is they will go up to a complete stranger if they have a dog, and just go over and say, hey, can I pet your dog? And they start making baby noises to the dog. Dog people are great. Not that there's anything wrong with cat people. So um, I have a cattle dog, an Australian Blue Heeler. An Australian Blue Heeler is, well, cat people would love an Australian Blue Heeler because they shed a lot. And they're very loyal. They're like a shadow. You don't need a leash. But uh, they're, not, they're not cuddly. They're the kind of dog that will meet you at the door and say, Hey, welcome home, I love you. I'll be over here in the corner and let you know if anything changes. So I missed having a cuddly dog. I know, ex-Marine biker, and I want a cuddly dog. So uh, I told my wife, I said, I wish we had a pit bull again. I'd like a female and a brindle. And we were just passively looking, nothing serious. And uh, one day I got a phone call at work. She goes, honey, I, I found a, a female pit. And she's a brindle, and they're, oh, really? And she goes, yeah, it's a... Uh, it's a rescue. I'm there, oh, 
I didn't want to rescue Pitt because I don't know, I don't know anything about it. You know, if it was a Yorkie or a poodle, yeah, I would think about it, but this is a pit bull. You know, I don't want to rescue a pit bull. And uh, she goes, well, it's not really a, a full bred pit. It's a mix, and they're mixed with what? Rottweiler, Wolverine, you know? <laughs> no, now I definitely don't want it. She goes, well, it won't hurt to go look. So I came up with a diabolical scheme. I would make an appointment with the people, go look at it myself, say I didn't want it, which I already made up my mind, I didn't want it, and everything would be cool. Happy wife, happy life, I don't get the dog. So the day comes to go meet the, the dog, and uh, about half an hour before work's over, my wife gives me a phone call. She goes, we're ready. And they're ready for what? She goes, me and the girls are ready to go see the dog. And they're, oh, no, no, I'm just going to go up by myself. She goes, oh, oh, no, you're not. So you already know how the story ends, don't you? Uh, we go up, meet the dog. The dog's adorable. I come home with the dog. Team Estrogen wins, three to zero. And uh, Rosie is the name of the dog. And she's absolutely, a, I know. Yeah, she is adorable, isn't she? So um, we get the dog home. And uh, the next morning, I go to feed her. Now, Cody's the cattle dog, Rosie's the whatever she is. And um, so I put food in Rosie's bowl, put food in Cody's bowl, and Cody devours his, and Rosie won't touch hers. So uh, Cody finished hers, and I'm there, uh, you know, I just attribute it to nerves or something. So that night, came home from work, I did the same thing, filled up both bowls, and she wouldn't touch it. And Cody ate both, he's, he's loving this. So I call the vet and I said, hey, Rosie's not touching her food. And she goes, oh, don't worry about it. It's probably new surroundings. She's getting used to it. So um, I go to bed. The next morning, I do the same thing. Well, Cody goes right for Rosie's bowl. And I go like this to push him away. And I spill the bowl. Rosie devours every morsel all over the floor. She's like making like a piranha. She's like making dog noises I never heard before. And they're, oh. It wasn't the food, it was the bowl. I don't know why she was afraid of the bowl, it's just, I put it up there so you could see it, it's just a stainless steel bowl. So she needed the food, she needed to be nourished, she was hungry, but she was intimidated by the bowl. See, to a lot of people outside of our church, the four walls are the bowl. They know, they sense inside them that there's something missing, that there's more to life, but the building is like the bowl. They're kind of intimidated by it. To paraphrase Pascal, God, there's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every person, and it can never be filled by any created thing. It can only be filled by God himself. A similar example, my sister, uh, my twin sister, her name's Rose, by the way, and yes, we name our pets after the family members, it's a family thing. But she worked for a private hospital administering a program for the state of New York which provided preventative health care services to the needy. And she developed this program and she was all excited about it. And they went out into the community and uh, they had an event and uh, crickets. Hardly anybody showed up. And so she called me and, and expressed uh, her, her disappointment, and through talking to her, I, I asked her, I said, well, Rose, how are you dressed? And she goes, how we always dress, business casual and white lab coats with the hospital logo on it. And I said, you know, maybe next time try the same thing, but wear hoodies and jeans and, and sneakers. Well, about a month and a half passes, and uh, she calls me up, and she goes, Larry, we did that. We wore uh, Arnott Hospital uh, fleeces, and the response was overwhelming. The people came, they were calling their family members, getting flu shots, blood pressure tests, so much so the newspaper came and reported on it, and she was delighted. It wasn't the services. It wasn't what was being offered. It was, I guess, the sign of institutional authority. They're people, not projects. They needed the services. They wanted them. They made their lives healthier and made it better, but they were intimidated by the lab coats. In 2015, Mark Chavez, professor of sociology, religion, and divinity at Duke University, co-authored a study. And in that study, they found out that 94% of Americans born before 1935 claim a religious affiliation, but for the generation after 1975, that number drops to 71%. 
68% of Americans, 65 years and older, said they had absolutely no doubt that God existed, but less than half of those 18 to 30 had the same conviction. The Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life in 2012 conducted a study which showed that one in five American adults have no religious affiliation whatsoever. None, zero, not a zip. That is the highest percentage ever recorded by polls conducted by the Pew Research Center. So, I did a five minute Google search of your area. Um, they put census data on it, I don't know how accurate it is, but we'll use those numbers. The dotted lines represent less than 11 road miles uh, from this church. Schuylkill Haven, Cresona, Lake Winona, et cetera. Comes out to about 15,000 people. One in five, for those of us who went to public school, 20% of 15,000 is 3,000. 3,000 adults in this area within 11 miles of your church have zero religious affiliation, zero. Now. Let's add the kids, because that was just adults, right? Let's add the kids, and let's assume that maybe 10% of the people that said they do have a religious affiliation are in fact casual or passive Christians. You know, Christmas, Easter, funerals, weddings, occasional Sunday here and there. We add that up, it comes out to 4,500 people. 4,500 people within 11 miles of this church have little or no religious affiliation whatsoever. To put that in perspective, on 9-11, when the Twin Towers came down, 2,997 people perished, and the world stopped, stopped. Now that's 4,500 people based on data from 2012. What do you think it'll be a decade from now? More or less? See. Media and popular culture bombards us with depictions of Christians as mean, judgmental, homophobic hypocrites. Of course, like Rosie, those 4,500 people are apprehensive about the bowl, right? And some who have actually, sadly, some who have actually experienced church have had awful or hateful things perpetrated by either the prelates, the clergy, or, or sadly, even the congregants. Of course, those 45 people want nothing to do with those wearing the lab coat or the institution. But then how will those 4,500 people understand the true nature of our Savior? Right, that only Jesus can fill that vacuum that Pascal talks about, that their souls are pining for. How will they experience the overwhelming joy Christ can bring into their lives? Or or even in your prayer requests, that, that peace that surpasses all understanding when you're dealing with cancer or divorce or, or all the things life throws at us. That without Jesus Christ, there is no salvation. There's no everlasting life. How? Because they're certainly not just gonna stroll in here. You know, maybe one or two, but they're just not gonna stroll in here on a Sunday morning. In Romans, 10, 14 through 15, and I'm sure you're familiar with this verse. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard of him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? And that is why the scripture says, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. Evangelia, evangelism, evangelia, good news. It's a simple message, salvation through faith. See, the more things change, the more they remain the same. In the uh, 18th century, George Whitfield, John Wesley, were denied access to the pulpits to preach the message of salvation by faith, which is ironic if you think about it because it was that simple message that Martin Luther had his epiphany that formed the Reformation. That simple message, they're denied access to the pulpits. So what they do, they went into the town, into the countryside, directly to the people. Now, the commoners, who quite frankly were the laborers that actually built the church, rarely had suitable attire to attend the church. And if they could attend the church, 
In some cases, there was a pew tax. They couldn't afford the pew tax, so they were relegated to the cheap seats in the balconies and the stigma attached to that. I mean, there was no social welfare in those days, and they, quite frankly, they were preoccupied with survival. So Wesley and Whitfield met the people where they were, as they were. Does that sound familiar? I mean, Christ doesn't wait for us to spruce up our lives a bit. He met each and every one of us as we were, where we were. That's what happened to me 21 years ago. A neighbor invited me to church. 21 years ago, invited me to a community EC church on Visitor's Day. And as unfathomable as it is, I'm standing here before you. The simple, pure message of the gospel, salvation by faith through grace, was devoured by those people, the disenfranchised who wouldn't darken the doorway of a church. They were starving for the gospel message. It wasn't the food, it was the bowl. The revival was so contagious and widespread that historians today call it the Great Awakening. A few godly men on horseback, meeting people where they were, as they were, they changed a nation, and quite frankly, the entire world. Now, they didn't have social media, they didn't have cell phones, they didn't have TV, they didn't have radio. They had a simple message of salvation by faith and horses. The Great Awakening occurred with an outward-focused model. Can I get an amen if anyone here thinks our nation could use a Great Awakening? Amen, right? Jesus went through all the towns and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. See, the good news today, to be missional today, you don't have to go to some far off country and eat rice with every meal. It's right outside your doorstep. I mean, there are 4,500 people within 11 road miles of this church that could use this message. In the Marine Corps, we would call that a target-rich environment. If there's any Marines in here, I'll take an oorah. Oorah! Anyway, sorry, I had to get that out. It's the Marine equivalent of amen. So, <laughs> however, still the most effective means of evangelizing today is the same as it was all those years ago, through personal relationship. And relationships take time, and there are absolutely no shortcuts. Two, two Sundays ago, I stalked you. Um, no Marine likes to go into battle without intel, so I wanted to see what kind of church it was, so I sat through two services. Do you know, the, what is it, 30 feet from the front door to the sanctuary, there must have been a half dozen people that welcomed me. It, you're probably just used to it. In the Febreze commercial, they call that your nose blind because it's normative to you. You're just used to how friendly you are. I'm telling you from an outsider coming in, it was almost electric. But those in here were fed, were educated, were nourished, there's fellowship. But to those 4,500 people out there, they don't know, quite frankly, how cool and welcoming and loving you are in here. And nor will they. How can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go tell them without being sent? What are you passionate about? It's not a metaphysical question. I mean, what are you, pa if today you had all the time in the world and your to-do list was your to-done list, which it never seems to be, what would you do? What would you do for fun? How can you leverage that avocation to build relationships that occur naturally um, with others that, that have a similar passion. Th this type of missional work really is easy and it's fun. You just have to be you. I already know you're friendly. You just have to be you, leveraging your passion for doing what you love and build relationships first. You remember I said dog people are kind of, they just go up and talk to somebody who has a dog? 
People have pictures of their dog on their phone. I know how the conversation goes. Oh, you have a husky, oh look. And they start showing Fifi, or whatever the dog's name is. There's no, there's no tension there. There's commonality. That type of mission work can happen in your community, and it can happen today. What do you love? I'm just lucky I love motorcycles. Um, in some cases, church out there, it may never come into here. Church out there may look totally different than church in here. Here's a slide. We had church in a biker bar, in a biker bar. They didn't use the room on Sunday mornings. We asked if we could use it. And we had people, we didn't market it or uh, promote it as biker church. We promoted it as church for those that aren't comfortable in church. Uh, there's a, a couple in our church, a community evangelical congregational church. They lived in Laureldale, and they noticed that none of the neighbors really talked to each other. So they started out with prayer. They'd walk their dog through the neighborhood and pray for the houses. They decided to have a picnic, not a church picnic, no over-religious thing, just let's get to know each other picnic. And so people from the church, like myself, came to help serve the food so they could mingle. It was a success. Later, they said, hey, we should do this on Tuesday nights. Let's have dinner together. And like the picnic, the dinners would start with an invocation and then casual conversation. Then they said, do you guys care if we talk about Jesus uh, at, after dinner? At first, you know, maybe half the people left, but they still came back for dinner. To this day, a year later, there's 20 people that go to church on Tuesday nights 20 people that would never set foot in a building like this. Now, I hope that they do, because here there's all the resources in which to build their, their, their life with Christ. But if they don't, they're getting churched Tuesday nights in someone's living room. And the members of the congregation are making the food so that they can minister. Triple Tree is an example of relational ministry. Um, a lot of Christian clubs are insular. They're more like fellowship. They go for ice cream runs or go for rides, and that's all well and good, but we're not like that. And in my world, you can't just put a patch on your back. It's a good way to get run off the road by the dominant club. The proper procedure is you go to the dominant club and you ask permission, can we wear our cut or our colors, as we refer to it, the, um, they may or may not grant it. We were told we couldn't wear our colors. So like say you're in California, you would go to the Hells Angels or the uh, uh, Mongols. Texas, it'd be uh, the Banditos. Ohio would be the Outlaws. So you know the, the dominant club in this area. I'd, I'd rather not mention the name. But they denied us. They denied our very existence. They said you could wear T-shirts. So okay, we wore t-shirts. Well, a couple months later, we found out that one of their members went down, he went down hard. He was in the hospital. So we decided we were gonna have a benefit. We we're gonna raise money. Because a lot of these guys, they don't have health insurance. They're on the fringes of society. So what was really cool is that people like me that are in, go outside were supported by other people within the congregation uh, that provided food and all that stuff, and we raised 2,500 bucks. So the president of the club put it in a paper bag, and we made arrangements to meet the president of the dominant club. He handed him the paper bag. The guy opened it up, and he goes, what's this? And we said, it's 2,500 bucks for your brother. He goes, why would you do this? He said, well, because Christ tells us to. And this guy, president of a dominant motorcycle club in Lancaster County, in Lancaster County, the Bible Belt of Pennsylvania, where you can't turn in any direction and throw a stone without hitting a church, said no one has ever done this for us. The first example of Christian compassion and Christian love was in a paper bag in its purest form meeting the needs of the people where they are, as they are. So, as I said, 
in Triple Tree Ministries, we are in it, we try not to be of it. Since that day, since that day where we listened to God in humble obedience, did not force our will, assert our will, say, well, we've done weddings for motorcycle clubs. Uh, you see the patches, who they are. We've been, on the bottom right-hand corner, do you see the patch that says sons of Satan? Sons of Satan. Do you know what we're doing there? We're baptizing his wife. Sons of Satan, and we're baptizing his wife. Do you know what happens in an event like that? Because it's important to her, it's important to him, and because it's important to him, the entire club comes, and they hear the gospel. The Dominant Club, I, I guess, realized that we were sincere, and as I said, we were allowed to wear our cuts. There's a toy run in Lancaster County, it's huge, hundreds of bikes, and they fly like crazy to the Hershey Hospital. And that president came up to us and said, came up to Rev, our president of the club, and said, hey, can you pray before this? What? That never happened. Look at the name on the back of their vest. That never happened. So we go, sure, he was taken aback by it. So he just gets up there on, it's an elevated area, and he, and he starts to pray, and, and people are still talking, because this isn't normal yet. There's no invocation at a run like this. And the president of the club says, yo, shut up. He's trying to insert the epithet here, pray. I don't... I don't know what I was more astounded by, the fact that the president of this club said it's time to pray, or that he used an epithet in which to do it, but it was effective. You could hear a pin drop, and we prayed. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. See, we are merely the pane of glass. We're not the source of the light. But we are called to transmit that light. We're like the globe of a lantern. But if that lantern's hidden always by four walls, nobody's going to see it but this room. In Matthew, Jesus says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Let, let me paraphrase this. You are the light of the world. And Grace EC on this hill cannot be hidden. It will shine its light before others so that they may see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. See, every single one of us is called by Christ to go out there to transmit his light. We're called to be in this battle. And so, like it or not, we're in this fight. We're in this fight together. Now, look, we may or may not create the Great Awakening or we may not change the entire world like Wesley and Whitfield. But by God, let's leave a scar, shall we? Amen. Thank you, Larry. If you can just hold on a second, please. Uh, quite frankly, this is probably one of the best presentations I've ever heard from a guest speaker. Can we have a round of applause, please? Thank you. And on that note, I'm sure... People are probably wondering, as I am, okay, what do you need help with the most, and how can people here help make that happen? Oh, wow. Like, I feel like Rev need? when he was asked to pray. <laughs> <laughs> well, pray for us. Really, it's a, f what we do, I don't want to make it sound, I mean, it's not like we're in Pakistan or an Islamic country, but really what we do is dangerous. Um, not the riding the motorcycle, but the places that we go to. It's pretty dangerous. So if you would pray for the ministry, I'm, and Cyril, if you would add that to your prayer list, I'd appreciate it. 
And um, if any of you guys, I mean, it's not for everyone. I heard an ura from a Marine. Marines make really good, make really good members because they like danger. They like that, that rush. And uh, so to minister to the 1% motorcycle uh, club, you don't have to be tough because really only by emptying ourselves, who we are uh, at the foot of the cross, emptying us completely, can God infuse us with the true power, his power, right? So yeah, I'm a big guy, but that means nothing compared to Almighty God. So, but if you have anybody that might be interested in this ministry, give me a call. But your prayer would be really appreciated. Thanks. If someone wanted to contribute financially on their own, independent of Gracie C. Uh, there's a, on our website, there's a, uh, I think a donate now button, but I. Is it tripletreeministries.org? Uh, yeah, I have my cards. I'll leave some cards here. It is tripletree, tripletree.org, I think. Hang on, I should read it. I should, you put me on the spot, so. I'm sorry, I didn't mean no, to. No, it's that. totally cool. The tripletree.org. Okay. The triple tree. So. Is it okay if I just take five minutes to see if anyone has a question for Larry you'd like to ask? Does anyone, is that okay with you, sir? Yeah, sure. Would any, does anyone have a question? Shane, I know you're going to be going to school down there in Lancaster, and he's a Marine. Oh, really? <laughs> where's, where's he? Thaddeus Stevens, can you stand up, please? Semper Fi, Devil Dog, hoorah. Hoorah. All right. Thank you, Shane. <laughs> uh, but does anyone here have a question? There has to be something that piques your interest. For example, your most dangerous moment. Uh, well, here, do you I'll, go I'll, by yourself? Are well, you always by yourself? Are you with another member when you're riding with these guys? Oh, no. Well, we're a club, so we try and go together. But we all go to a home church, so on Sundays we pretty much disperse. Now next week we're going to surprise. Oh, this is really cool. So there's Veterans Riders Association, secular club. But we've been hanging out with them. Uh, pastor Matt has a new church in Reamstown. He's the new head pastor for Reamstown. He's friends with Ted. And uh, so I was at an event for VRA, uh, Veterans Riders Association. I said, hey, let's go surprise Matt at his church. So next Sunday, again, under the guise not bait and switch to surprise Matt. I'm taking a whole club of secular motorcyclists into a church. And what was interesting at their party, again, being in and not of, uh, they come up to me and say, you know, I used to go to church. I, uh, I love church. I just haven't been there for a while. Well, so I'm going to take them to church. And hopefully they won't be intimidated and it will become part of their, their, norm, their normal life. So, uh, yeah. That's the sort of thing we do. And this, this ministry that we're in in particular isn't necessarily for everyone because it's, uh, you know, I came from that world. I was pretty wild and... Uh, I was curious about your background and how you got Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I mean, that's old Larry when he had both his original knees. But, <laughs> so, I'm, so just like uh, somebody from the 4500 would come in here, they might be intimidated crossing that threshold because it's not their normal culture a lot of people from the Christian community would be intimidated going into my culture. So it's what's amazing, and I always honestly felt like I was on the B team. Uh, I didn't grow up in the church, I was, I was Catholic even though it's Christian, but it wasn't like this, where it's your family, it's your life. Um, so I always felt like I was on the B team, and it's, especially with all the stuff, crazy stuff I did. But God took all that and uh, those blemishes, those scars, and he made it something beautiful. Yeah, you're not supposed to cry when you're a biker, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> so I prefer not. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's amazing that God can use whatever we were, whatever we are, as we are, um, for his light, for his living water. It's humbling. I do not deserve to stand up here. There's people in this congregation that will forget more about the Bible than I know. And uh, I'm really hum humbled and honored that you would let me do it. We're so happy to have you here. Fantastic you. presentation. Again, a round of applause.